is keenly aware of experiments performed by an English country physician who in 1796 became convinced that he had found a way to prevent one of the world's deadliest diseases. In a recreation, the physician watches a boy in a tricorn hat. Wearing a scarf over his nose and mouth, he carries a tray of food to a stone outbuilding. The physician's name was Edward Jenner. The boy sets the food on a bedside table and runs away. And the disease was smallpox. On the bed sits a man covered with red blisters. Jenner noticed that the faces of milkmaids in his parish never showed the telltale scars of smallpox. Yet their hands were often covered with sores from cowpox, a similar but much milder form of smallpox. At a stable, Jenner points to a milkmaid. Perhaps if I can see that. Yes. A daisy, a moment of your time. Jenner examines Tell large blisters on the milkmaid's hands. hands. Since none of the maids ever got smallpox, Jenner began to wonder if catching cowpox somehow made one immune to smallpox. Yes, that's excellent. So he devised a dangerous plan to see if he was right. He scrapes pus from the milkmaid's blister. James, come in. The boy with the tricorn hat hesitates. Come along, Master Phipps. The boy, James, sits down. Now, if you roll up your sleeve. Jenner took pus from the cowpox scars of the milkmaid and scraped it into an incision made in young James Phipps. James winces. This will only hurt a little, and you're a brave boy, I know. This gave Phipps a harmless case of cowpox. Jenner spreads the pus into a small cut on James's forearm. All done. But there was only one way to find out if the boy was now immune to smallpox. Jenner opens the door to the stone outbuilding. Despite the grave risks and questionable ethics, two weeks later, Jenner exposed Phipps to a smallpox victim and waited for the results. Jenner covers his own nose and mouth with a cloth. He grabs James by the arm and shoves him toward the blistered smallpox victim. Fortunately for everyone, Jenner's theory was correct. James Phipps survived, and like the milkmaids, he never got smallpox. Jenner grins at the boy. James! Cowpox had given him immunity. Jenner gives the boy a cone. Jenner called his discovery a vaccine from the Latin word vaccinia, the medical term for cowpox. Most people were too frightened to try Jenner's revolutionary vaccine, but those who knew of its protective power did. Although no one, not even Jenner, had a clue as to why it actually worked. In a recreation, a man enters a laboratory in Paris, 1885. But almost a century later, Louis Pasteur is determined to find out. He knows cowpox is a weak form of smallpox that can prevent the more harmful disease. If this is a principle for disease prevention, it should work for other germs as well. An assistant ties on sleeve protectors. Pasteur begins testing his theory on animals and successfully makes a vaccine for chicken cholera. But he wishes to go down in history as a saver of human life. So he decides to take on one of the deadliest diseases in the world rabies. A caged dog jumps, froth clinging to its coat. Rabies was and still is an incurable disease caused by a virus, a germ too small for Pasteur to see. But he knows it's there. In the laboratory, Pasteur peers into a microscope. Using the spinal cords of infected rabbits, Pasteur tries to produce a milder form of rabies for a vaccine. But before he can complete the experiment, Events force his hand. Pasteur's assistant opens a door. A man carrying a boy in his arms presses his way inside. A young boy, Joseph Meister, has been bitten by a rabies-infected dog. In a week, he will likely be dead. I don't know what to say, but I think it's worth a try. Pasteur studies a wound on the boy's cheek. But Pasteur doesn't know if his experimental vaccine will kill the boy or save him. He writes about this defining moment in his memoirs. Joseph Meister would almost inevitably come down with rabies. As the death of the child appeared certain, I decided, not without deep and severe unease, to try the procedure. Pasteur is not a physician, so he asked the doctor to do the injection. You're going to have to do it. Pasteur hands the white-haired doctor a syringe. The doctor pinches some flesh on the boy's abdomen and brings the needle closer. Ah! 
Two weeks later, Pasteur receives a letter. Pasteur opens an envelope and takes out the letter. Dear Monsieur Pasteur, I am feeling good and sleep well, and I have a good appetite. Yours sincerely, Joseph Meister. Bonsoir. Grinning, Pasteur hands the letter to his assistant. This breakthrough had a significance far beyond a cure for rabies. In a flashback, the doctor injects the boy with rabies vaccine. Now the human race had a scientifically proven weapon in the war against infectious disease. But ironically, Pasteur, like Jenner before him, couldn't explain how the great discovery worked. Only in the 20th century did scientists finally understand what Jenner and Pasteur had given them. Now in a modern laboratory. Vaccines can't kill germs the way antibiotics kill bacteria, but they can recruit the body's own defenses to help ward off viruses. Computer animation shows a spiky green virus germ. When virus used in a vaccine enters the body, the immune system summons two defenders. Antibody proteins mold themselves to the virus to keep it from invading cells. Antibody proteins wrap themselves around the virus like a shield. It bounces off a cell. And if a virus does get into a cell, the body sends out another defender, killer T cells, that destroy the invaded cell as well as the virus trapped inside. Because the vaccine contains weak virus, the immune system easily wins. And now these tailor-made antibodies and killer T cells stand guard in the bloodstream, ready to defeat the stronger disease virus should it ever strike. Black and white footage shows vaccination clinics. With the development of vaccines for diseases like diphtheria, mumps, and measles, old viral epidemics began to disappear. When Jonas Salk produced an injectable polio vaccine and Albert Sabin made an oral version, many countries organized massive vaccination campaigns that brought this relentless crippler to the brink of eradication. In footage, children wearing leg braces play croquet. Vaccines were winning the war against viruses in the West. Footage shows a boy covered with blisters. But in poorer countries, most viral diseases still flourished. Even smallpox, the first illness to have a vaccine, continued to claim more lives than any other disease in history. In a series of photos, blisters spread on a boy's face. It killed without mercy, bringing a mask of agony to the faces of the dying. Former CDC Director Bill Fagey. I remember seeing children with their faces swollen with hemorrhagic smallpox and thinking, isn't this a shame that it's the last view the parents will have of this child. Former smallpox campaign director Donald Henderson. We had a huge hospital ward filled with smallpox cases. And as you walk past the beds, these people looked so distressed. And you could identify at least half of them who were going to die. A young British physician just put his hands on the balcony rail outside and said, I cannot again do rounds on a smallpox ward. In 1967, the World Health Organization decided to mount a global vaccination campaign to wipe out smallpox forever. But the disease was so widespread, experts predicted total eradication was doomed to failure. Even its leader was skeptical. Donald Henderson. It was such an overwhelming problem. There was a time where we really had our doubts that we were going to be able to succeed. For the mammoth task, Henderson recruited young idealists who immediately became known as the smallpox warriors. Later, many would rise to prominent positions in the field of public health, but now they were just doing their job, which meant getting the vaccine to extremely remote places. Donald Henderson. A number of these had rather long hair. They certainly weren't individuals who were likely to show up and be well received at a, an embassy cocktail party, but they worked tirelessly. They were real heroes. And they needed courage because their task was truly daunting. But they were spirited and they had a vaccine that could be easily administered by scratching the skin with a special serum laden needle. Smallpox also had characteristics that gave Donald Henderson realistic hope he could break the chain of transmission. 
we always knew where it was wherever the virus was the individuals